Good morning. Here is my desk after a heavy construction phase. Debris everywhere. Even the logbook has been neglected for the last couple of days. And the object of all the activity is in this box. So what is all this? Well, I started to have some trust issues in some of my equipment. You've heard the saying about clocks, a man with one clock always knows what time it is, but a man with two clocks is never sure. It only gets worse when you have three clocks or four clocks. When I say trust issues, I'm not talking about oscilloscopes cheating with each other because, let's face it, this one is of a completely different generation to this one, and in any case, this old Japanese oscilloscope runs on 100 volts, so I haven't even powered it up for the last three years. No, the trust issues I'm talking about are about different readings from different pieces of equipment, or even in the case of this oscilloscope, from different probes. See, I have two probes here of unknown origin, both different, neither of them the original ones that came with the machine, and they sometimes read a slightly different value, or it doesn't agree with my DVM, or one DVM disagrees with another, or the voltage on the power supply doesn't agree with the DVM, and so you have all of these differences in opinion between instruments, and lately that started to get troublesome. It's a very long story which I won't go into. So I'm a member of the PHSNA, the Poor Hams Scalar Network Analyzer Group on groups.io, and they had been discussing a power meter I didn't really follow the discussion but yesterday morning um, an email popped up about a nice power calibrator design by DL7AV so I googled for that and one of the sites I came across was this site by DL6GL um, the design was published in CQDL in September 1999 so exactly 20 years ago now and I believe for a while it was produced as a kit or a product. Um, anyway, so I decided that this was perfect timing and, and uh, would be very useful for me at this moment. This is the uh, DL7AV calibration generator as built by DL6GL. You can see it has a 3.5795 megahertz crystal oscillator here. It runs off a 9 volt battery, it has a 5 volt uh, regulator and this the oscillator output from the generator is then amplified by an RF510 followed by a low pass filter here. The, the important part is this op amp here in the lower center section which is used as a comparator to look at the 5 volts from the voltage regulator and then a rectified version of that coming through from the RF and to apply some feedback to the gate of the RF 510 so that it always stays exactly the same the voltage coming through from the RF and the voltage coming through from the 5 volt voltage regulator. Then the RF is fed into an attenuator here and produces 0 dBm output and it's also fed into a further attenuator to get minus 60 dBm output. So the two outputs here, uh, 0 dBm is exactly 1 milliwatt according to the definition of dBm. Minus 60 dBm is, dBm is equivalent to S9 plus 11 dB on an S meter. It's a very low signal level as a voltage and so these sections all need to be shielded very carefully. So my actual construction fits in one of these famous Altoid tins. Inside you'll see the space for a battery and the circuit there in the middle, the oscillator, amplifier and uh, amplitude feedback loop. And on the right hand side in those shielded boxes which are made from uh, a tin, tin can remains. These are some food tin cans which have been chopped up long ago and are very useful for such things. Tin is actually very easy to solder, much easier to solder than copper-plated uh, PCB. So on the right hand side are the attenuators and the coax in the top uh, produces 0 dBm and the one on the bottom minus 60 dBm. And what you see here is a QRP Labs 
dummy load, that's the 50 ohm load for it, with the oscilloscope probe across the load. So my son and I, we went to the supermarket to find a battery and uh, came back with this 9 volt Duracell battery. Of course, I didn't have a connector for this and a useful tip here is that if you have an old battery, you can often just salvage the termination from the top of it. You, if you very carefully peel, peel away the metal case of the battery, you can actually salvage the connector and use that as a, as a battery connector on a, on a new battery. This particular battery I found in the junk box had been around I believe since around 2009 and has heavily corroded and expired so one of the cells inside has actually expanded and pushed its way out of the bottom of the battery but nevertheless the top part of the battery with the connector on was in perfectly good condition and makes a very good uh, connector when reversed to use on the battery in the calibrator unit. And you can see here I have a toggle switch to switch it on and an LED to indicate when the power is switched on. As I'll explain later that LED will actually go out when the battery gets below its useful life. So I've made quite a few changes to the circuit and the reason for that is I built it entirely in a few hours from drunk box parts. I didn't order anything for it and so some parts substitution resulted in some things not working as I thought they should and, and so it ended up somewhat different from the original. This is the circuit as I actually built it and you can see quite a large number of changes. The first one is the oscillator circuit. So looking in my uh, drawer of crystals there were a few crystal oscillator packages but they were at frequencies like 64 megahertz, 100 megahertz, so there was nothing at the frequency I was interested in. I was interested in a 7 megahertz version of the calibration generator because the 40 meter band is the one that I'm working with most at this particular moment and I need to get the best calibration for at the moment. So I built this oscillator from inverter gates, just what was on hand. So I created an oscillator using a 74AC86 exclusive OR gate, which I happen to have in the junk box. Any time you can create an inverter with a gate, then you can create an oscillator, and you can do that easily with an exclusive OR gate by just connecting one of the inputs to 5 volts and using the other as the input to the inverter. I've used this particular circuit a number of times, and it always works reliably. I use it here with a 7 MHz crystal, which I also had in the junk box, and I follow that by a single inverter stage just as a buffer and then the two unused gates and just ground the two inputs to stop them from floating. The next change that I made was in the amplifier circuit here. Um, I wasn't happy with the output of the original circuit. I don't know if that's because I changed the 7 MHz or not. Um, I just changed it to a circuit that I knew, which was, uh, um, I've just put a choke here in the gate circuit of the RF510. Uh, it, 23 turns is not critical, it just happened to be one that was already wound in the junk box. I've then followed that with a low pass filter, 7 element low pass filter, which is just the QRP Labs low pass filter kit, but built ugly style rather than on the PCB. I also found during later performance testing that the LED here, which is supposed to go out when the voltage of the battery falls too low, I found that, it, that I could actually put two more diodes in series with this LED and have it extinguished completely at a voltage of about 7.2 volts. Now below 7.2 volts, and I'll come on to these measurements in a moment, the uh, regulation of the feedback loop stops working and so the output starts decreasing. So anywhere above 7.2 volts, and I measured all the way up to 20 volts supply using the power supply, anywhere above 7.2 volts 
the feedback loop keeps the output precisely at 0 dBm but below 7.2 volts it starts to drop so I changed this resistor I made the resistor lower and I put these two dot diodes in series so that the LED lights brightly but then goes out quite quickly when it approaches 7.2 volts so it'll be a very good indication on the battery powered unit of when the battery needs to be changed The next change I made was to the op-amp. Um, I didn't have an LF356 that the original circuit used, but I did have this CA3140, which also has a very high impedance input. It's a CMOS op-amp, and so was suitable for use in this circuit. Anything with a CMOS input should be fine. Um, I made a change at the output here because I wasn't happy with the fact when I looked at the output on an oscilloscope, there is some residual level uh, some 7 megahertz sine wave superimposed on this output with some distortion and so I added this extra stage I broke up the uh, feed to the gate of the RF510 by putting in this extra integrator stage with a capacitor here in the middle the result is that the voltage at the end here the DC voltage at the end is uh, has a very almost no um, RF on it at all it's just pure DC I felt that the original RF that was superimposed on the output here of the integrator would probably not do any good to the signals going through or the regulation. Um, at least it couldn't do any harm to break that and put a capacitor in, inside. I used 1N5819 diodes uh, just because they're shocky diodes that I have a large number of because they're used in the QCX. 5 watt transceiver kit, so I happen to have them on hand. I didn't make any ad attempt to match the parameters or anything fancy like that. Similarly, the voltage regulator I've used is just the basic 78L05. I haven't used a more precise 5 volt regulator. Uh, now, the resistors I used in the resistor network here. I found unfortunately that I didn't have um, any all those values in the resistor box. I do have a tray of 1% resistors but the values available were quite limited. So that isn't actually a problem. Um, I went back and started just synthesizing the values um, so you can make up um, resistor values by putting resistors in series you just add the values together or putting them in parallel in parallel you take the, recipro the reciprocal of the two resistor values and add them together and then take the reciprocal again as an example uh, I didn't have any 180 ohm 1% resistors but I did have 220 ohm and 1000 ohms so using the formula here um, 1 over 220 plus 1 over 1000 and taking a reciprocal I get 180.33 ohms which is much closer than 1% to the value of 180 so it should be satisfactory in the circuit. I was able to do a similar thing to get all of the resistors that I needed from the resistor values that I happen to have in my junk box. Just some playing around in the calculator is all that's required and so by either using series resistors such as the 620 ohm here or parallel resistors such as the 180 ohm or various combinations of serial and parallel I was able to get very close to all the values which I needed. Similarly the 3.3 mega ohm resistor I didn't have any of those but I did have 6.8 mega ohms so I just put two in parallel to get 3.4 mega ohms slightly different from 3.3 .3, but it's not a very critical part of the circuit. Other than that the circuit is pretty much the same as original. I have a 9 volt battery here, an on off switch and the 0 dBm and minus 60 dBm outputs. I put shielding which is indicated by this red dotted line here. I put shield shielding around four different compartments and so um, the way I did that you can see I start here constructing with the tin sheet cut with a pair of tin snips 
um, this is the zero dBm attenuator already assembled here and then I started uh, filling in with more compartments so I've got a total of four compartments just as the original and then I soldered lids onto each compartment individually so there's a very good RF seal between the compartments. I'm not actually convinced that that level of overkill is required but uh, it doesn't do any harm. I always say you can never have too much decoupling or too much shielding in RF circuits and particularly when you're doing a home proof project you don't really need to worry about cost. So let me show you how well this thing works and I was actually very surprised. Um, we'll switch it on and have a look here at the oscilloscope. And you can see here the amplitude around 633, 630 millivolts. That's across a 50 ohm load. So now how do we convert that to power? We use Ohm's law, current equals voltage divided by resistance, and also we use power equals current multiplied by voltage. If we substitute that, those two, we get power equals to voltage squared divided by resistance. However, this voltage that we require is the RMS voltage. Um, the oscilloscope showed me the peak-to-peak -peak voltage. Now, my particular oscilloscope does have an RMS voltage facility, but uh, many don't, and so it's very easy to just read off the screen the peak-to-peak -peak voltage. Um, I got around 632 millivolts. We have to convert that now into RMS. And the way that I like to think of this is just flip the lower half of the sine wave up onto the positive axis here and then we have to calculate effectively the area underneath the sine wave half segments uh, to get the RMS voltage and it turns out that the math through the mathematics that uh, the peak voltage here is half the peak to peak voltage because I just flipped that lower half of the sine wave onto the top here and the RMS voltage is 0 0.707 times the peak voltage 0.707 is actually 1 over the square root of 2. Putting all of that together, power equals V squared over resistance, uh, which is the peak to peak squared divided by 2 twice, because I'm squaring it, and square root of 2 twice, because I'm squaring it. And when you multiply all of that out, square root of 2 times square root of 2 is just 2, so 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, and putting in the resistance value of 50 ohms, I get a very simple equation here, which I remember in my head, but this is just showing you the, the derivation. Power is equal to voltage squared divided by 400, where this voltage is peak to peak. So that's a very easily formula to remember and to use. Every time you have a peak to peak voltage from the oscilloscope, just square it and divide it by 400 to get the power. So putting it into our example, with 0 0.632 volts, uh, square it divided by 400, it comes out to 0 0.001 watts, very close, which is actually 1 milliwatt, which is the definition of 0 dBm. So surprisingly, because I say surprisingly because nothing I build ever usually works that well first time, but when you look at the output on the oscilloscope and see 632 millivolts, that is exactly 0 dBm, which is what we were hoping for. So how it does that is uh, using this feedback loop um, and the idea being that if the output amplitude of the RF here is too low it will increase the gate bias on the RF 510 which will increase the gain of the RF 510 and in the in the amplifier circuit and therefore produce more output. If the output is too high it will compare against the 5 volt uh, from the regulator here and it will lower the bias on the gate therefore reducing the amplitude. So I actually did some tests, um, some measurements with the oscilloscope to look at the output, peak to peak output into 50 ohm load here on the left hand side and then to measure the feedback voltage applied to the gate of the RF510 here on the right hand side and what you can see is that up to about 7.1 volts here at this point um, nothing works properly but it's not really surprising because the uh, 5 volt regulator has a 
performance according to the data sheet that it requires at least 7 volts to regulate properly. And so from about 7 volts onwards, what you see is this gate voltage applied by the correction circuit is gradually decreasing um, to apply less and less bias so that as the voltage is increased, it brings the RF output to a very, very steady level here of 10.64 uh, volts peak to peak according to my measurement. So that 10.4 volts peak to peak goes into the attenuator. 10.64 volts would be uh, 283 milliwatts which is around 24 dBm. So the attenuator has to attenuate by that amount 24 dBm to get down to, uh, by 24 dB to get down to uh, 0 dBm output. Now coming over here to the spectral analyzer, let's see how it looks. Well, you can see here the measurement is almost exactly on 0 dBm, which is really pretty amazing. So either the spectrum analyzer and the calibration tool are both off by the same amount, or they're both very well calibrated. So that's a great result. Here's a close-up of the cursor reading, the marker reading on the spectrum analyzer. Um, the amplitude here was hovering around 0 dBm, plus or minus a very tiny amount. Um, in this photo, minus 0 0.02. The frequency measurement on the spectrum analyzer is not terribly accurate. Um, I'm not worried about that. So the second harmonic's at about minus 30 dBc, the third harmonic is at around minus 43 dB. Uh, not spectacular, I would have expected a little bit better than that, and uh, given that it's a seven element low pass filter, but I'm not really bothered to investigate further, you know there could be a layout issue, this is all just constructed ugly, hanging over a copper clad PCB. Um, I'm not going to bother to investigate that any further at this moment, because the harmonic content is not really the important thing here. What's important is that the amplitude is a good stable reference value. Now I've changed to the minus 60 dB output here and let's see how that looks on the spectrum analyzer. There you, see, there you go, there's the uh, minus 60 dB and again look at that measurement it's very very close to minus 60. So I would say this project is really um, a good success and uh, very pleased that finally I have some kind of reference signal generator to use uh, to check the rest of the equipment. Very nice. So thank you for watching and uh, now with all the renewed confidence that I will have in my test equipment and all the trust issues resolved, I can continue with my development. Bye now.